Welcome to our next Driving Matters vodcast series, produced by the Traffic Injury Research Foundation in partnership with Labatt. We all want our family and friends to come home safely every day. So we're discussing typical risky situations we have all seen or encountered on the road. And we're also sharing tips to avoid risk and ways to positively influence the behavior of those around us. It features a variety of guests who are making roads safer in their communities and workplaces. We're tackling top risks, including speed, distraction, and impairment. We break down the science to explain how our choices every day can create risk for ourselves and others, meaning some people might not make it home. If you've never been involved in a collision, you might assume it's because you're doing everything right. But the truth is, the unexpected happens on the road every day, and the difference between a near miss and a collision is measured in millimeters and milliseconds. So if you're not prepared or simply fail to recognize the hazard in time, what could have been a near miss becomes a collision. So let's talk about why driving matters. Welcome to our Driving Matters 2.0 vodcast series produced by the Traffic Injury Research Foundation in cooperation with Labatt. Today we're going to talk about impaired driving. And for most of us, impaired driving is a topic we're familiar with and we've talked about it for many years. And more recently, with the legalization of cannabis in Canada, there has been much more focus around drug impaired driving, but awareness around drug impaired driving continues to be much lower. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about alcohol and cannabis and the way it impairs the human body as well as the ways that it impairs driving skills. And we're also going to be talking about uh, tools that police officers have on the road to detect alcohol and drug impaired driving, and most importantly, strategies to stay safe and ensure all of us make it home at the end of the day. So I'm Robin. I'm pleased to be joined by my co-host, Karen. And I'm also happy to introduce a uh, drug recognition expert officer, Carl Mayer, who is with the Toronto Police Service. So welcome, Carl, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So let's start with the ways that alcohol and cannabis affect us physically. How is it affecting you physically? I mean, uh, you're going to have a decline in your visual function, so you're, you're not going to be able to see things as well as you usually would once uh, you've had a bit of alcohol. Um, you're going to have trouble multitasking, so it's going to be able to affect uh, the ability to do numerous things at, at the same time, which is a key thing that you have to do when you're driving. Um, you're going to have some issues with your judgment. You might lose your judgment. So oftentimes with impaired drivers, we find that they um, go in a little bit too fast for road conditions because they, they think that's fine. It'll decrease your reaction time. You'll see something and you won't be able to react to it quite as quickly as you normally would. And are the impairing effects for cannabis similar to alcohol or are they a little bit different? No, they're very similar. Uh, at the same time, there's some, some other issues with uh, maybe confusion or uh, cannabis cause, can cause sleepiness depending on what strain of cannabis you're using. The most likely thing with cannabis is a lot of the time it affects your memory with your short-term memory. So you kind of lose that, that understanding. And I think that leads to uh, mistakes when you're driving. Can you expand on that a little bit in terms of the connection between the impairing effects of alcohol versus the impairing effects of cannabis on the driving skills that are needed? Cannabis is obviously its own drug category, whereas alcohol is what we call a central nervous system depressant. So it's going to have different effects on your body. So I know you've already touched on some of the impacts of impairment on driving skills, but I wonder if you could just delve a little bit more deeply into how cannabis and alcohol can affect a driver's ability to make the decisions that need to be made on the road at any given time. When you're driving, there's so many things that you need to be able to do. You need to be able to focus on what's in front of you. Uh, you need to be able to have uh, your gas. You need to be given it the, the right amount of pressure. You need to know when to brake. Uh, if you have a, a manual transmission, you have to know when to clutch in, clutch out. You have to look for the vehicles around you. You need to look for cyclists, pedestrians, unexpected events. And uh, a lot of the times when you're impaired, these you're not able to divide your attention and, and multitask. So when we're looking for impaired drivers out on the road, we're, we're looking for those people that are having trouble maintaining their lane, um, maintaining proper speed, either going too fast or going too slow or going too fast and then going too slow, just not able to, to, to go the speed that they're supposed to on the roadway. 
And then when these unexpected events happen, unfortunately, this is, this is when collisions occur. When somebody in front of you stops short for a vehicle or for a light, your reaction time is slowed and you end up into the back of their vehicle. Your point's really interesting about the difference in, in speed, um, going from slow to fast and all that. And, and one of the, and I think pretty confident it's a myth that's been bandied around specifically to do with cannabis use while driving, is it mellows me out. It makes me a calmer driver. It makes me more relaxed so I'm not going to fall into that road rage and I, I don't speed. How does that actually play out in real life? Cannabis has a very similar effect to, to a stimulant in your body. It actually it raises your blood pressure. It raises your pulse. It might be giving you a sensation that your body is more relaxed, but your body actually isn't. If you're smoking cannabis before, before driving, you're not going to be a safer driver out on the road. I can guarantee you this. And if you're mixing alcohol and cannabis, you're definitely not going to be safe. The cannabis can lead you to believe that you're not quite as impaired as you really are. So one of the things that I've heard, uh, particularly with cannabis impaired drivers, is that they're often picked up for speeding, um, which kind of is, contradicts their perception that they're a safer driver. So is that true? It's one of the numerous reasons that we pick up uh, drug impaired drivers. Some people just want to get home after a night of being out and they, they unfortunately speed to get back to wherever they're going. I know I've looked at some of the research with respect to the combined effects of, of alcohol and cannabis. And one of the things that we see is uh, cannabis tends to make you a little more cautious, but even with a very small amount of alcohol, uh, alcohol encourages you to take risk or makes you more inclined to take risks. So when you're combining the two, the effects are additive. And I think what's most concerning uh, particularly in the last few years, is that many impaired drivers are, they don't just use one drug. It's not just cannabis or just alcohol or just other types of drugs. There tends to be that combination. And the most common combination we see is, is one of the most dangerous ones, and that's the alcohol and cannabis. So is that your experience when you're stopping impaired drivers? that it's multi-substances that they're using? Absolutely, yeah, we call it polydrug use. And uh, a lot of the times when we, when we have people arrested for impaired driving by drugs, they provide their urine sample. Once the toxicology comes back, we're finding cannabis in a, a large number of the samples that are coming back. People aren't just uh, drinking, they're not just using cannabis, they're using other drugs and they're using them in combination. And we see that often in fatal crashes when impaired drivers are tested, that it is often multi-substances that we see. The most common combination tends to be alcohol and cannabis. And among cannabis uh, positive uh, fatally injured drivers, we actually see that a significant percent of them are using uh, alcohol or other drugs in combination. And a much smaller portion is actually cannabis only. Robin, you'd mentioned just before we go back to Carl, you talked about the additive element of combining alcohol with cannabis use. Can you put that more in maybe layman's terms? What does that actually mean? Right, so uh, talking about crash risk, it's important to understand the way alcohol uh, affects crash risk as well as the way cannabis affects crash risk. So mild to moderate amounts of cannabis does increase your crash risk and generally drivers using cannabis have a greater odds of injury anywhere from 1.8 to 2.8 times more likely uh, to be crash involved or to be injured. Alcohol is very different, even at very low blood alcohol concentrations, so very small amounts of alcohol, the crash risk begins to escalate uh, as low as 0.02. And for that reason, most jurisdictions across Canada have administrative penalties for impaired drivers with a blood alcohol concentration between 0.05 and 0.08, which is the legal limit, we see jurisdictions imposing penalties. And that's because the crash risk is much higher. Then when you um, are at very high blood alcohol concentrations above 0.08, uh, the average blood alcohol concentration in a fatally injured driver is, driver is actually a 0.17. The crash risk becomes exponentially high. So you are much more likely to crash, many, many times over more likely to crash 
when you're impaired by alcohol. And that's why combining alcohol with marijuana is so dangerous. Um, you greatly increase your crash risk. And that's what I mean when I say that the impairing effects are additive. So when drivers are pulled over, one of the things we've often heard from police officers across the country is there is the explanation that I've, I've just had two drinks. Um, so based on the tests that you do, the standardized field sobriety tests and or the, the drug recognition expert exam evaluation, are they just having two drinks or are they having much more? And do they realize how impaired they are? I think a lot of the times if they tell me that they've had two drinks, unfortunately, they've, they've usually had a lot more than those two drinks. Um, as with cannabis, we'll, I'll often hear, oh, I, I smoked a joint five or six hours ago and I'm fine now. And clearly it's the, the joint was smoked pretty recently prior to driving. You can tell that from the behavioral indicators with the tests that you do, you can judge their level of impairment with a high degree of accuracy simply because um, the types of impaired driving behaviors uh, and cues you're looking for are pronounced. Is that is that true? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's certain cues that we look for with uh, alcohol versus what we would look for with somebody who's been uh, regularly using cannabis before driving. So when you're looking at alcohol impaired drivers, predominantly the crashes are occurring evenings and weekends. So Friday, Saturday, Sundays. Is the same happening with cannabis use? I would say no. I would say with alcohol, absolutely. You see it more at night and more on the weekends. That's when it's uh, society has told us that's okay to drink. You no, know, you, you can't show up to work smelling like an alcoholic beverage and not have somebody at work talk to you about it. Whereas it seems nowadays you can show up to work uh, with your clothes smelling like weed and nobody's really going to question you about it. So a lot of uh, the impaired drivers that we find, it, it can happen any time of the day with, with that. It can be people at uh, seven o'clock in the morning headed to work that just woke up. So that makes it even more important that for other road users to be aware that that is the reality out there. So being that much more engaged uh, when you get behind the wheel of your vehicle, you're not impaired, you haven't drank anything, you haven't in, um, taken any cannabis, but you are actually sharing the road with people really at any time of the day who could be impaired by cannabis. Absolutely. And I think we see that uh, with respect to the prevalence of drinking and driving when we do national polls and uh, ask Canadians to self-report. So what we see is a small proportion of Canadians admit to drinking any amount of alcohol and driving. And we see approximately 7% of Canadians will admit that they've driven after drinking within two hours and when they feel impaired. So they admit to driving when they felt they were probably impaired and should not have done so and we're seeing uh, in the last few years with respect to the cannabis legalization, we are seeing an uptick in the percentage of Canadians who are self-reporting using cannabis and driving, uh, using cannabis within two hours of driving, um, as well as using alcohol within uh, two hours of driving. Um, but the good news is a majority of Canadians choose not to drink and drive, choose not to use cannabis and drive. And I think that's why it's so important for, um, for Canadians to speak up about their choices and why they choose to be safe on the road. In your experience, did you see a difference pre-pandemic compared to maybe the first year of it and where we're at now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The first... <laughs> four or five months of the pandemic, the, the vehicle traffic on the road was, it was pretty light. Um, people were staying at home. Uh, people were working from home. Whereas over the last say year or so, uh, people have gotten back to work. I, I feel like the roads are probably just as packed here in Toronto as they were prior to the pandemic. So everything has kind of gotten back to normal on, on our end. And that ties into the alcohol and cannabis use as well, pre-pandemic compared to now? Absolutely. The bars, the bars are back open as long as you're vaccinated. Um, if you go down to King Street in our entertainment district, there's about as many people there as there were before the pandemic. So things are things are ramping up again. The city's coming back to life. So I think you make a, a good point, Karen. I know from the national polls that we've done, we have seen a change in driver behavior pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. 
Um, so the good news is the majority of Canadians didn't really change their behavior, to Carl's point, uh, with respect to a range of road safety issues, including alcohol and cannabis. What we did see was that a small percentage of Canadians were more likely to uh, use alcohol and use cannabis and driving. And we saw an increase just from 2020 to 2021. There was a small proportion of Canadians who were more likely to use those substances before driving. But perhaps positively as well, we also saw that some Canadians took less risks and maybe it was the concern about health and safety that we've seen generally over the last two years with respect to the pandemic. We are seeing some Canadians choose to drink and drive or use cannabis and drive less frequently in 2020 as well as in 2021 um, as a result of the pandemic. And I think one of the things maybe we, we need to do is capitalize on the reasons why those uh, drivers chose to be more safe on the road by avoiding risky behaviors, including alcohol and cannabis, and see if we can encourage other Canadians to do that. Well, I can definitely tell you from my perspective as a parent, the conversation around the, the dinner table changed drastically once cannabis was uh, legalized for recreational use from talking about these are these are the parameters when you when you're going to uh, go out for the evening and celebrate and our eldest daughter's 19 under no circumstances do you ever drive impaired or do you get in a vehicle with, with a driver who is impaired you call us anytime day or night we will come pick you up and i think that was a conversation that was pretty common for a lot of parents over the last several years cannabis is along the same lines. I found it was just a, a more uncomfortable conversation for me to have because I don't have experience in that area. There's a lot about it I don't understand. So basically, we just decided to apply the same uh, approach, regardless of what you may or may not be choosing to, to do as part of your evening out. The same rule applies. You never, ever get behind the wheel of the vehicle if you're impaired, whether it's alcohol or cannabis, or if you're not really sure, err on the side of caution, and you never get in the vehicle with another driver, even if it seems like it's going to be an inconvenience and I don't want to bug mom and dad, it's two o'clock in the morning. At the end of the day, you have to get home safe. And I, and I think that message is really important to get out uh, to families out there that you've got a plan in place to make sure everyone gets home safe and nobody's feeling pressured. Do you have any um, suggestions or tips for those conversations that maybe parents are having to have with their their of age teens now that are still living at home with them, Carl? Yeah, we, we have to keep doing better at getting the messaging across. I remember uh, police officers coming into school and talking to us about, about drinking, drinking and driving. And uh, yeah, we need to find a way to get across to the kids now to to tell them it's it's the same impaired is impaired if, if you're going to get behind the wheel or get into a car with somebody who is impaired you're putting your life at risk you're putting other people's lives at risk so they're important conversations to have and uh, hopefully over the next couple of years we can keep developing strategies to get the younger people to know that that yeah they can't get behind the wheel after they've smoked a joint just the way they know they shouldn't get behind the wheel after they've had a beer or two. That brings us to a conversation about fatal crashes. We've seen significant declines in the prevalence of alcohol in fatal crashes. And today, one in four fatal crashes involves alcohol as a contributing factor. So those declines have really been a result of the movement to, um, to reduce drinking and driving and to discourage drinking and driving. Unfortunately, with cannabis, we are seeing an increase in fatal crashes involving uh, cannabis as a factor, um, more so than alcohol. So, um, Carl, one of the worst parts of the job is dealing with those fatal crashes. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the the impact that it has um, for the police service in terms of responding to fatal crashes? It's absolutely devastating going to fatal crashes. I mean, you're seeing stuff that no human should ever really have to see. And then the worst part is going over and telling the families about the, the loved ones that they've lost has a lot of effect on our members it has a lot of effect on the families involved and it's uh it's particularly frustrating when these collisions and these fatal traffic uh, collisions involve uh, somebody who had too much to drink or somebody who was smoking cannabis prior to getting into that vehicle 
really because it's preventable. These crashes did not have to happen. So if you had one message that you could deliver to impaired drivers before you stopped them on the road, before they made the choice to get in their vehicle, uh, what would that be? There's no excuse nowadays. There's, there's taxi cabs, there's ride sharing, there's public transit available for everybody. There, there's no reason that you need to get behind the wheel instead of spending $20, $30 just to be safe and take a cab ride home. And I think the tried and true designated driver applies here. Um, I'm admittedly, I'm a lightweight. It's a big joke around the family. Uh, one drink is more than enough for me. So my husband, who is considerably taller than I am and, and larger than I am, I, I'm. it's not like I'm going to try and keep up with him for any reason. We always establish well ahead of going out for the evening. One of us will either have a drink or two and the other one has None. Carl, any final words of wisdom um, to Canadians out there in terms of things that they can do to uh, to prevent and uh, reduce impaired driving? We do know that most Canadians, when they're drinking, they're drinking with friends, they're drinking with family. Um, so are there strategies that those uh, people in their peer group, the friends and family around people who are drinking can, um, can use to discourage them uh, from, from getting behind the wheel after they've been drinking? Absolutely. I think the biggest one we talked about it was, was having a plan. If you know you're going to go out and, and have a couple of drinks, then have a plan, have a, a sober friend there with you who you can trust. And that's such an important thing because uh, you need somebody that you can trust that's not going to be able, who's not going to drink while they're there. Have that plan for a taxi or for a ride sharing or for transit and just, just have a backup plan too. If all else fails, call a family member who you know will come and come and pick you up. Reach out to somebody. Thanks very much for listening to our discussion today. And I very much appreciate Carl, you joining us and Toronto Police Service for all the work that they do out there to keep the roads safe uh, and to make sure that we all return to our friends and families at the end of the day. Thanks a lot for having me. I'd also like to thank our sponsor Labatt for making this episode possible. And please tune in to our other episodes of Driving Matters 2.0. Thanks, bye. Thank you for tuning in to our Driving Matters 2.0 vodcast, produced in partnership with Labatt. Turf is a registered Canadian charity with a number of free education programs about leading risks on the road, as well as ways to stay safe. They provide access to free fact sheets, infographics, and blogs to download and share. Start a conversation about the reasons you choose to avoid risks on the road. To learn more and access these free resources to support safer roads, visit www.turf.ca. That's T-I-R-F dot C-A. Working together, we can all help everyone to get home safe every day.